Ow. It's dark. What happened? Oh, yeah, did she t uh, poop out on us? Uh, well, you'll just want to open that now before the show starts. Yeah, let me get. They can hear you. They can't see you. They can hear me, but not see me. Hello, everyone. He cannot see me because I mean. Every time I do that, this happens. Today, but if you hang on, you should be able to see me because I'll take wash off and I'll put on Clarex. Is it um, over? Dang it. That's okay. We'll make it work. And I'll just, should I just keep talking to keep everyone company? Hey everyone, we have new sound effects. Want to hear them? That's applause. Yeah. Should I keep going? <laughs> Here's crickets. The only issue is these are too long. I just need short bursts of sound effects. Here's the rim shot. I like that one. Mm -hmm. Then there's... That's for when I sing. What if I just tap them? No, nope. even tapping them and it still goes long. So hello for all those of you who tuned in and are wondering why you can't see my uh, lovely face. It's because Because it's pure evil. I'm sorry, we're just waiting a minute. There we go. Yeah, we're on. Yeah, I think we have everything now. So, hi everyone, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, can they, are we getting thumbs up? I see Patricia from Scotland is here. Is here. She's here! Can they hear me? Testing, one, two, three. I wrote this song to test the sound. Do da, do da. Oh, okay, people can hear? All righty then, hello everyone. Welcome to Quantum Catechesis. I'm Father Joe Krupp and you are not. And today is Wednesday, May something, and it's 2022, I think, ish. And I'm excited to be here with you guys. I'm excited we got this gosh darn thing fired up and ready to dance. Okay, I'm not gonna dance. But I was sent a video of Father Lay kind of dancing today. Really? Yeah, you heard me singing to the little first graders, yeah. right? When they were cutting from the gym, I started singing about how much I love them in a loud operatic voice. I need a librettist, because my lyrics were rough. <laughs> Wait, it's a librettist. Isn't that the person who writes lyrics to an opera? I think so. Um, yeah, no lovely research assistant today because Chuck, I don't want to say he's pure evil because he's not pure at all. But uh, anyway, I'm so excited to be here with you guys. And today, we're kind of getting close, I think, to the end of Foundations. We'll see uh, what kind of things you would love to see us address that we haven't uh, 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 addressed. Um, and we're going to start. So we kind of looked at the problem. Uh, we looked at uh, which was our, our fallen human nature and how Jesus took that on and combined it with his divine nature in his very person and how his death uh, uh, put our sin and nature to death and his 
resurrection opened heaven for each of us and then how he disseminated his spirit among all who love him uh, so that we have his Holy Spirit in us. And what we're going to look at today is the big kind of fruit of that, which is what we call the church. Okay. So, um, that's what we're going to look at today. And it's probably going to take us a couple sessions. But before we get into it, I do want to tell you that I'm really excited because tomorrow, unless something crazy happens, you're going to meet the best friend I have in the whole world. Uh, Father Jeff Rose will be here. We have been friends since we were little boys. And uh, we were both ordained priests. I was ordained way ahead of him because I'm so holy. And I'll be honest, he's not. But on the positive side, <laughs> <laughs> but all kidding aside, I can't wait for you to meet him. He uh, is the president of the Salesian High School in Toledo, Ohio, and he is a big part of an orphanage in the Philippines. Uh, he goes there a lot and takes care of the kids there and helps them raise some money uh, for those kids. It's really, uh, he's probably, I don't know how to explain him except he's the best friend I got. And I thank the, do you hear my chair? I thank the Lord for him every day. So I'm very excited for you to meet him. Friday, are we going anywhere unusual or is it here? No, uh, there's so much excitement this week. We'll leave it up. Yeah. And then Friday will be our last show in this studio. We are moving studios. Uh, which everybody who comes here does comment on this, and they're right. This is a tiny room. This was my gun safe room. <laughs> uh, sorry, this was my gun safe room before we converted it to uh, a studio. So I had a big gun safe where Carrie is and a ton of ammo here and tools too. We put, kept our tools here. Um, and it's actually pretty small. Uh, so it will be good for us to move to a place where we can move around a little bit. And uh, we're geeked out about that. So this weekend, pray for us. We're going to be doing some heavy lifting. And we have to figure out how to get that thing out the door. And I assume it's going to involve disassembling the whole bloody thing and then praying that God kill us all. Because <laughs> it won't fit through the door. We assembled it in here. Uh, Carrie and John and I, I think, mm -hmm. did. Yeah. So, so it's an exciting week here at Joe and Black Ministries, and I thank you guys so much for being a part of it. Um, and if you would, please consider subscribing to our podcast, unless you're listening to it now. You know, uh, Joe and Black Ministries on any of your internet podcast thingers, um, and on YouTube, if you like and subscribe, that helps us a lot, right? Those are the two best ways we think for you to follow us. Um, Facebook, uh, less and less, you know, uh, in the sense of, um, YouTube just works better <laughs> being candid. So, okay. So let's get right into it. What we're going to be talking about today has a really cool name. Ready? It's called ecclesiology. And you might think, what? Don't worry. You don't need to remember it. Although you can, if you want, uh, it comes from ecclesia, which is like church and then ology, which is study of, this is the study of the church. What we're kind of looking at is how does the church view herself? And, and I'm going to, I want you to get used to that right away, right? The church always describes itself as her. Okay. Um, so there is no other, there's no other, what do you say? The church sees itself as a female, uh, and that's really important. That's a huge part of our understanding of self as a church. And we're going to take a look at it. The official definition of ecclesiology is, quote, the study of the Catholic church, its nature and organization as described in revelation or philosophy. So if you think about you, if I said, what's a human? What are you? Well, I'm human. Okay, what's a human? A lot of times that might be tough for us to answer. Even though we live the mystery of humanity every day, we might think, well, I, I don't know what a human is. Um, the Catholic Church teaches us a human is a body-soul unity, and that's super important. Don't even get me started on that. But how does the Church understand herself? If you say to the Catholic Church, what are you? She has an answer. And we're going to take a look at this. So the first thing we're going to do is this three-step thing, okay? And the first step is what you and I need to know is the church is a person, okay? It's not, quote-unquote, just an institution. And it's not a human institution. It's a divine 
person, okay? The church is a person. And why does that important? Because that's the first and what I want to walk you through of three steps. How does the church understand herself? Well, first, the church sees herself as a person. And why? Because people grow and develop, but the core of them doesn't change. Maybe their expression of themselves changes, but they themselves don't. So my brother uh, told me this once, and it was so crazy when I was holding one of his little boogalies. He said, you know what's crazy? When she is... Uh, it was funny, she's graduating from high school. This She just graduated from high school Sunday. He said, when she's an adult, she'll have the exact same soul as she does at this moment. And we, we just kind of sat and soaked in that for a while. How crazy is that? That when she's a 90-year-old woman, she has the exact same soul as when she was a tiny baby. What changed is her exterior and her connection to that soul and the way she describes that soul to the world and lives that soul. Is this, is this making sense? The church is the same way. She is who she is. And she will always be that even if her expression changes. And if we understand the church as a person, it might help us understand her history a bit better. Because if you go to a secular college, they'll reduce 2,000 years of church history to the Crusades, um, Galileo and um, the Inquisition, right? Just take 2,000 years. And to be candid, they're going to teach all three of those to you very badly. Um, that's what they do. Um, most of them buy, buy what's called the black myth, but we, why not why get into that? So in the end, the church is so much more than that. Uh, for example, um, did you know the first telescope built so that people could gaze into the heavens and study the stars was by the Catholic Church? They built the first telescope. You know that there's 14 craters on the moon named after Jesuit priests because that's who found them? Um, the Big Bang Theory was articulated first by a Catholic priest who worked with Einstein. We have always been about learning and knowledge and science, and it's so funny that that's the thing we're attacked on all the time. Um, but anyway, be this as it may, the church is more than three events in her history, and she's more than this wonder that loves science. Right, George, Gregory Mendel, the guy who uh, discovered genetics, that was a monk. Gregory Mendel. Um, and we could go on and on and on, and I'm so tempted to. But what you need to remember is when she was young, this church, she was tortured, she was persecuted, she was oppressed, she was a distinct minority. And that has had two effects on her, it seems to me. Now, this is my opinion, historically. One, the church always fights for the little guy. Um, despite, again, the stupid things you were taught, the reality is for hundreds of years in European history, the only thing fighting for the peasant was the church. The only thing standing between the brutality and callousness of royalty was a bunch of priests and bishops and popes. You know, well, there were bad, uh-huh, there were bad priests and bishops and popes and there were great kings and princes and dukes, but that wasn't the norm. Right. The norm was this obsession with we fight for the vulnerable, we fight for the tiny. Why? Because that's right at our conception. Right? But the other thing that's in there is we did what every oppressed people have done. Once we got power, we oppressed. <laughs> that's, we learned really, really well the lessons of our oppressors. When Romans were tearing Christians to pieces, burning down their churches, confiscating their sacred writings, as soon as we got power, one of the first things we did was try to set up a system where no one can do that to us again, right? Does this not sound like a human? Isn't that crazy? Um, there were times as a young church, we were way too aggressive and sometimes we were way too passive. Uh, there were times when we made incredible moral stands that no one else would make, and there's times where we really dropped the ball and could have made a strong moral stand. Um, the history of this 2,000-year-old church is the history of a person. Um, and if you think about your teenage years and your arrogant 20s, um, is that you? 
Or was that you? And did the you back then need to happen so you could be the you you are now? Well, yeah. Praise God for that arrogant 20-year-old. Right? Praise God for that clueless teenager. Right? You get what I'm saying? That the church never, that I know of, has shied away from, yep, we did that we shouldn't have. Right? Because it made us who we are today. Um, and I think it gives us a powerful perspective that gets lost for two reasons. Uh, one is because we are all in bubbles. So on my Facebook page, and I swear this is true. I swear this is true. Uh, I have, you know, the bishops have put up a post on Monday that says we should care for the migrants. We should care for the immigrants. We should fight for them. And the first response is always, you never speak about abortion. Why are you always talking about these, these law-breaking people? And then Tuesday, we are a pro-life people. We don't believe in abortion as birth control. We don't. And what's the first response always? Why are you always talking about abortion? Why don't you ever talk about immigrants in the border? And I've tried, I tried a couple times with reasonable appearing people to say, well, go look at their archives. It's right up there. Go look at the USCCB archives and you'll see they've covered exactly what you're talking about a million times. Well, they weren't loud about it. That's always the answer. No, you weren't curious about it. You get me? We end up with this false view of the church because we let other people describe her to us, even though we're a part of it. We let other people define what the church is. And then of course, right now, and I know I say this a lot, but it's objectively true. You have Catholic organizations who definitely can make money by convincing you, no, don't give to the bishops, subscribe to our service because the bishops are evil. Why are the bishops evil? Either because they're liberal or conservative. It just depends on what selling point they want. You, you know? And the other thing is we let historians who really, and I don't mean this mean, they don't really research. <laughs> they, they just accept what they were told by people who accepted what they were told by people who accepted. Their, this is a traceable historical phenomena that is called the black legend. You can look it up. And it was this idea that Protestantism in particular really rewrote the history of the church in the, well, basically the 12th through the 16th century to justify breaking away. Um, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, be this as it may, the church is what she is, um, just like you are what you are. And there's stuff in your past that people still judge you on that you know they don't actually know the truth. And there's stuff in your past that they know and you're like, yep, that was me. <laughs> The, the church is that too. And she will always strive to grow and to develop. Uh, and she'll simultaneously fight growing and developing, just like you. Okay. Uh, someone, uh, uh, this is great. Could you explain how the church is a divine person? She seems more like a human person, right? Just like you and me. Yeah, you're a divine person. Uh, I'm a divine person. Uh, but we're not real good at acting like it, you know, nothing in a, this is funny. I'm corrupting a C.S. Lewis quote, right? Nothing proves the doctrine of original sin better than watching the news, right? Uh, we, we, we don't need a lot of proof that humans are faulty and broken. Uh, the miracle isn't that the church, uh, it's a miracle that the church is still here. We've done everything wrong in so many ways. But we're still chugging along. It's remarkable. I think I told you, Dr. Peter Crave wrote a whole article on this. Truly, that one of the hints that the church might be the right deal is she's a wreck, right? Uh, who was it? Oh, I, maybe I shouldn't say his name, but one of the priests in our diocese who's a minor historian, it's so funny, he says, what other institution that's international, right? People from every race and tongue would put the Italians in charge of the money and say, yeah, great idea, uh, right? It's so funny, right? That Italy at its most corrupt time made sure they only had Italians running the church. And this is gonna shock you, but then the leadership was corrupt. 
Yeah. Um, but at the same time, and this will blow you away, that's the golden age of saints in Italy. That's the age that produced all these people, forgive my phrase, but at the bottom of the hierarchy, who looked at the abject corruption of the top and went, all right, I'll do it. Uh, it, it is hysterical. Uh, every time we've had a great pope, we've had a weak hierarchy, or a weak um, laity. And every time we've had an incredible laity, we've had weak leadership at the top. It's just how it goes. And I don't know if that's God's intent or if that's some sort of uh, human dynamic. I don't know. But yeah, she acts more human just like you and I do. huh? And it drives me nuts too. But I keep trying to remember, thank God she's human and a wreck because then I can be a part of it. That was a great, I love that question, didn't you? Yeah. How are we doing? Are people content? Okay. So now we look at... Well, okay, so what is defining of this, hu this, this person that is the church? Well, the most important thing I think you can know about this person that is the church is that she is the bride of Christ. That Jesus is the hunter, the groom, and she is the hunted and the bride. And again, chill out if, if you think, well, those are very sexist, blah, blah, blah. Those are cultural constructs that we adopted, right? And of course, there are women that are hunters, and of course, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I, I long for the day we can just talk like rational people, you know what I mean? <laughs> and not worry about all the, well, what abouts? Yeah, you know? Because I never know what to do with that discussion, uh, I, right? I, I, I really don't. Like, We'll say, you know, well, no, don't go there. <laughs> but you ever notice how often we do that as humans? And it's become so defining in the last 10 years of our, like, here's an example no one does, right? Killing humans is wrong. Oh, what if they're trying to kill you? Of course. Do I really need to tell you that? Right? Or what can we assume people of intelligence and goodwill can, can figure out the exceptions? Can't we just say the norm? You know what I mean? Yeah. Speeding is wrong. Well, what if I gotta get to the hospital? What do you think? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know what I mean? So anyway, blah, blah, blah. All this to say, here's very much how the church sees it. And without exception, and from the very beginning, we the church are the bride, he is the groom. The wedding was the cross. The cross is the, a wedding bed. Okay? Meaning what? This is where the blood of the bride was shown. What were Jesus' last words? Consummatum est. We translate it, it is finished. It means it is consummated. This was the thing the groom said after in Jewish weddings at the time, he and the bride stepped into a side room and consummated the marriage. And then he came out with a sheet, showed it to everyone and said, it is consummated. Right? This is what Jesus said on the cross. It's consummated. Meaning, we're married now. This is our covenant. And I will never, ever leave you. Even while you're killing me. Well, then great, I'll die for you. This is the church's key understanding of herself. She is bride. That's why when you hear the Eucharistic prayers, the church refers to itself as her over and over and over because she's the bride. And, and the baptismal font, that's her womb. That's the waters of the womb of Holy Mother Church. And we who are baptized are products of the union of Christ and his bride, the church. If you watch the Easter vigil, you saw when we were blessing the waters of the font, what did the deacon do, right? <laughs> Took this giant <laughs> thing, uh, can I say a phallic thing, and dipped it into the water of the font three times while we asked God to uh, make fertile the womb of the church for the life that was about to be produced. When you go into the font, you die. You come out a new creature. And what are you? The child of this beautiful union of Christ the bride, or Christ the groom, the church the bride. Over and over, what does Jesus use in the Gospel of John in particular? Uh, when he talks about the kingdom of heaven, it's the wedding feast. The wedding feast. The wedding feast. 
over and over he uses wedding imagery. When you look at the Revelations, the book of Revelations, when God describes the end of the world, what is the heavenly Jerusalem now? It's the bride, quote, adorned in jewels for her husband. Right? That God seeks to enter this covenant with his people. He had sought it forever, and in the person of Jesus, he made it happen. Take a look at how this was prophesied. How are people doing, Kara? Are they happy? Okay, this is from the book of Hosea. Okay, you ready? This is considered one of the innumerable prophecies in the Old Testament to the church being the bride of Christ. Quote, this is God talking about his people. What's up? What verse? Huh? What chapter? I'm going to jump around. It's Hosea 2 primarily. Okay. Well, it's all it's Hosea 2, a bunch of chapters in there, verses in there. Quote, so I will allure her. I will lead her into the desert and I will whisper to her heart. From there, I will give her all she had. She will respond to me as she did when she was young, when she came up from Egypt. On that day, says the Lord, she shall call me my husband. I will make a covenant with her on that day. I will make the covenant with the beasts of the fields, the birds of the air, and the things that crawl on the ground. I will espouse you to me forever. I will espouse you in right and in justice, in love and mercy. I will espouse you in faithfulness, and you will know I am the Lord. On that day, I will respond, says the Lord. I will respond to the heavens, they will respond to the earth. The earth will respond to the grain, the wine, and the oil, and all of these shall flow to you. I will say, you are my people, and she will say, my God. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Right? This is the Lord's message from the beginning, and we believe the church is the fulfillment of that message. That this person that is the church is a female, and she is his bride. So whenever the church talks about herself, she's the bride. This is why marriage is huge to us. This is why we don't feel free to fart around with the definition of marriage. This is why for us, marriage isn't, well, two people like each other. Marriage is, in the church's teaching, this 2,000-year-old tradition, a reflection of the groom and the bride. The groom is Jesus. The bride is the church. And their whole life, they are to live out the mystery of Jesus and his bride, the church. And you hear it in the wedding prayers. It's not subtle. And if you put down your iPhones and actually listen to the prayers, boom, you would hear this over and over in the wedding ceremony. That this isn't about, forgive me, this is going to sound crazy. This isn't about, well, we like to be around each other. This is about companionship. No, it has, those are maybe side effects. This is about, we're going to imitate Christ and his bride. We're going to make life, right? We're going to, we're going to help each other get to heaven. Okay. And the body of the bride and the body of the groom tell the truth. That's, that's a big part of St. John Paul II's theology of the body, right? And, and forgive me, I don't mean to be crude. They line up. And when they line up, they make life. Okay? So that's why, by the way, we're so stuck in this thing that drives our secular culture nuts. We're like, well, that's not a marriage. You can call it something else. We're totally with you. You want to call it a civil union? We're with you. you whatever you want to call it. But for us, as it has been since longer than this country, much, what, 10 times the amount of time this country existed. No, marriage is a sacred reenactment of the bride and the groom, right? And the bodies tell the truth. Okay. So what happens then? Stick with me. How are people doing? Uh, I need them to get this for us to take the next step. Do you feel like people are getting it? Yes. Okay. So now what happens when a bride and a groom enter a marriage covenant? We say the two become one. Yeah? Now we've arrived at the third step. The church, who, a person, the bride of Christ is the body of Christ. The two are one. 
Yeah, that in the same way that you have husband and wife coming together and in that sexual union, their two bodies become one and in that body becoming one, they're proclaiming what's happening to their souls. In the same way then the church says, well, we are Christ. We're the two are one. And that's the third step I want you to look at. The church as the body of Christ. This is really important for us because what we understand then, and I can't get Catholics into this, I can't, I, I'm trying, I'm working hard at this, is I heard, of, especially to be candid, at very liberal or very conservative congregations, right? You'll hear this constant griping, the church needs to. Well, you're the church. Do you mean you need to? No, we usually mean those other people. Okay? That when we talk about what the church needs to change, we're never talking about ourselves. <laughs> but that's what we should be talking about. I can't help who's pope. I can't help who's cardinal or who's bishop. And God's not me, put me in a position where my opinion on that matters. And if you gave me a saint for a bishop, I'd probably kill him because I'm a sinner. Okay, uh, I mean, obviously we hope for a saint and we hope then that my hunger for holiness compels me to change to live like a saint. But that's not usually what happens. Usually what happens is we say that person's not like me, so they must be bad. <laughs> okay, that person said something that I don't believe, they must be wrong. Uh, this is why the whole body of Christ image struggles because we keep saying, we keep taking all the wrong points, if I may be so bold. We say the church needs to change. We're talking about the hierarchy, right? We're not certainly not talking about ourselves. And then at the same time, that same hierarchy who we say is responsible for everything, when they tell us what's right, then we say, well, you aren't in charge. It's we're all one body. You get it? We keep painting ourselves in these ideological corners so that no one would kill our sacred cow, which is usually our opinions, our politics, what we wish was true to justify what we want to do. Okay. So you end up with right-wing Catholics tearing apart left-wing Catholics. Okay. I, I saw it today on the whole thing about the shootings in Texas yesterday, that horror we saw. What did Americans immediately do? What they always do, the right stopped talking <laughs> or said, hey, we're praying for you. And the left said, stick your thoughts and prayers. We want action. Okay, what action would you like to do that's not motivated by prayer? Just seriously. And what prayers do you want to do and what, you know what I mean? Like, I would love for the people praying to pray about, do I need to change my perspective or do I need to serve in some way? And I would love for the people to say, and quit your thoughts and prayers to come up with something, I don't know, that might help. Because laws don't seem to be helping. <laughs> this is a problem. This is a cancer in our soul of our country. And surprise, years of telling kids you're oppressive, right? You're sexist, you're racist, you're all these things at birth. Surprise that they get a little screwy. Um, when do we tell them their value? And not their value in terms of, well, you can change things to be more like I want to teach you they should be. No, when do we praise them for their intrinsic value just because they exist? You exist, so you're beautiful. I don't need you to get an A. I don't need you to be good at sports. I don't need you to be good at any. You have value because you can breathe. You can draw in and expel the breath of God. And instead of focusing on that, we're teaching them crazy things and we're surprised they're a little crazy. Yeah? We inundate them with violence and sex. We hand them these supercomputers and say, oh, just get after it. But what do we think would happen? Really? I mean, can you imagine? Right? Imagine, seriously, there's a crowd of two billion people and your kid says, hey, I'm going to go in there unsupervised. Yeah, get after it. Well, that's what we do with the Internet. Yeah, run into that crowd of two billion. Come back when you're done. Right? Dinner's in a few hours. We do that on the internet. Are we surprised they encounter wicked, demonic people? And are we surprised that some of them become demonic? 
we have a process. We have a cancer in our souls, and we all participate in it every time we accept the lie, whatever the lie may be. Every time we put our opinion above truth, every time we refuse to change because we'd rather not. Yeah. The church is his bride and she is his body. And we are a part of that. We are one with Christ. Christ was shot yesterday in Texas with all of those children. Christ was, was with the, the, the guy who ran in and, 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 and saved from more deaths. I, I don't know. I could go on and on. You get me. We feel their pain because it is our pain. And it's an unspeakable pain. What does Jesus want us to do? Tell us, Lord, and help us to actually listen, even if it makes us uncomfortable, even if it contradicts an American value as we perceive it. To be the body of Christ means to be re- we re- need to be ready to get stuck to a cross. And not because we sinned, but because we're trying to do what's right because that's what happened to our spouse, and we're one with him. This is, okay, so this is, um, I guess in a sense, the answer to, to a lot of our questions about church leadership and church function, that the church believes that if you're a Catholic, you need to have a feminine soul And for males in the church, then, it's a particular bend. And Dr. Peter Kraft writes a lot about this. He has a lecture called Sexual Reconnection. It's quite worth your time. But whenever people say to him, why do more women than men go to church? He says, because it's easier for women. They have feminine souls by birth. Men have masculine souls by birth, but they have to train those souls to be feminine. Meaning what? To receive to not be the initiator. Remember, the body speaks the truth, okay? And the male soul is like the male body, but he needs to learn to receive. And people always tell me, if you want to get men involved in the church, you got to get them working, got to give them a project. And to some extent, I totally agree. But also men need to be willing to fight that battle in their head every day. Lord, I'm not here to do anything for you. Ugh. Right, guys? <laughs> Isn't that stink? You know, when a woman you love tells you her problems, and you're like, well, how can I fix this? You can shut up and listen. And as men, that's so hard for us to believe. Really? Am I going to get yelled at for this later? No. She wants you to enter her experience. Right? She just wants you to be present. If she needs your help, she'll tell you. She's not helpless. But that's hard for us. What I want to do. Yeah? And this is a big part of, I think, why men struggle in the church sometimes. It's hard for us to be the receivers. It's hard for us. Am I making sense? This is even shown in how we go to communion. You don't take communion. You receive communion. Okay? And I could go on and on on this. And, of course, we're always in danger of me doing this. But for you and me, our goal is to live Christ in the world. Well, what did Jesus do? Well, then that's what I'm going to do. Because I'm one with the groom. And that's how the church understands herself. It's why you have uh, male clergy. Male, uh, right? Because the male at mass is playing the part of Jesus, who was a male. At a time when, again, we, we were taught wrong. We were told, oh, they wouldn't have listened to a woman. No, they wouldn't have listened to a man. There were a ton of priestesses. There were a ton of prophetesses. That was considered a normal function that women received. Okay? The fact that, anyway, blah, blah. So what we want to remember is these three steps, I think, can help us understand the church a little better. The church is a person. Okay, What kind of person? A female. She's the bride of Christ. Well, what's true of a bride and groom? They're one. Thus, the church is the body of Christ. We are to be him in the world, receiving like a bride, giving like a groom. Okay? Good? All right. So that's a snapshot, right? Like if you were in seminary, this would be a year. 
this would be a year of studying because what they really want to, or at least when I was in, I don't know, I'm thinking seminaries changed a lot just based on what's coming out now. But this was something they could not pound in our heads strong enough. And as you can hear, it takes some work to get to and to answer. So it is funny. And again, forgive me if this seems insensitive. I don't mean it that way. When someone says, why doesn't the church have women priests? Well, I can give you an answer. I need 43 minutes. Right? The question takes two seconds, and rightly so. But the answer, we actually have to listen. And we might not agree. We might say, I don't buy that. Okay. But give me a shot here. Right? And I can't do it in a tweet. And what's curious and fascinating is if you would have told someone 50 years ago, tell me the meaning of existence in 50 words or less, if they could do it, you would consider them very shallow. But now it's a must. <laughs> You've got to be able to answer everything in 50 words or less, which that's, that's crazy. We're broken if that's true. And I think it's true. Yeah. Yeah, but if you can describe your worldview, right, and your, the ecclesiology of your church and the understanding of a human person in a tweet, then those things stink. You're not very good at them. This needs to be a thought, a process, a built upon. And for Christians, dear God, we start with Jewish anthropology. We had some Greek philosophy and holy crap, it's going to take, this was 5,000 years of development, right? It's going to take us a bit. In the end, the shortest possible answer on this model right here, why are there, uh, why are only priests, why are priests only male? Is that how I say it? Why are there no priestesses, right? Well, simple, because Jesus was a male. And we did the Last Supper. We participate in the Last Supper at every Mass, so we need a male there. Okay? The fact that that translates into power is a failing of the system, in my personal opinion. Right? The fact then that, again, and I always say this, the fact then that I get to be in charge is really odd to me. And it's not healthy. And whenever guys, you know, younger priests defend male priesthood. One of the things I always try to get them to see is, but as long as you live the priesthood the way you live it, then you're just telling women, sorry, you don't have any power. Trust us. And if we look at the last 50 years in particular, I don't think you should trust us too much. Am I making sense? As long as the priests make priesthood about power, then they're always going to leave women unsatisfied in their answer as to why there's a male clergy. And, they're, and those women are right, if you ask me. If this job is about power, then we should have women priests. And the same priest will tell you, well, it's not about power. Get to trump their finance council. So it is about power. Do you get me? It's this bizarre disconnect. I think if we priests lived it right, if we did what, I don't know, let me think, oh, Jesus did, and laid down our power, then we'd have credibility. Yeah? Jesus actually writes about that in Ephesians, right? Uh, remember the whole uh, husbands obey your wives and blah, 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 right? And people get, or wives obey your husbands and all that, and people get their underwear in a bunch, and rightly so, because we only read part of it. What's the first line? Stick with me. And remember, guys, I'm talking about ecclesiology, and so is Paul. Hear me out, okay? Quote, be subordinate to one another out of reverence for God. That's the first line that always gets skipped. Here's the next. Wives should be subordinate to their husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is head of the church, he himself being the Savior. As the church is subordinate to Christ, so wives should be subordinate to their husbands in everything. Stick with me. Husbands, love your wives, even like Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her, to sanctify her, blah, 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 that he might present to himself the church in splendor. So husbands should love their wives as their own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one hates their own flesh, but nourished it but nourishes it and cherishes it, even as Christ does his body. This is a great mystery, but I speak in reference to Christ and the church. In any case, each of you should love his wife as himself, and the wife should respect her husband. Okay, do you get what Paul did there? 
and why it's so dangerous, and I have seen this firsthand, it infiltrated the charismatic movement and basically destroyed it in my personal opinion. That people read this and said, why husbands are in charge, right? And I actually was subjected to talks on what did they call it? They had a name for this teaching. Okay. But it was the idea that, uh, well, my sisters put it this way, that men rule and women drool, right? Uh, what did they call it? The teaching of, but anyway, it was this idea that the husband is in charge and the wife follows. Um, and it was so messed up because right there at the end, what does Paul say? Yeah, but I'm speaking about Christ and his church. Husbands, you should love your wives. Wives, you should respect your husbands. That's what he has to say on that topic. Otherwise, he's talking about Christ and his bride, the church. And what did Christ have in that relationship? All of the power. What did he do with that power? Gave it to her and let her kill him. When we use this scripture to justify the idea that women are basically to be like children under their husband, then we've missed the whole point. Okay. Um, did this, did this, okay. So at what point did the clergy begin to be in charge? As far as I can tell, really um, for the European model, as it were, because not every country lives their priesthood like we do. Um, sorry guys, I hurt my tooth and it really hurts. Carrie punched me in the mouth. She wasn't subordinate. <laughs> Doctrine of submissiveness, that's what they called it. Wives, they called their women handmaidens. Isn't that glorious? Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, like if you look in the U.S., like we were, Dad and I were just talking about this. When he was a kid, the only person for, you know, and this is an exaggeration, a hundred miles in any direction with a degree was the priest. That was it. Um, when he grew up, the only people he knew were farmers. And what did farmers do? Worked all day. Both my grandma and my grandpa Krupp left school when they were children because you didn't need school to run the farm, okay? Now, you know farmers are smart. This isn't talking about farmers being smart or not smart. But then in strolls this guy who can run a business and who has a number of degrees. Well, of course he's in charge. That started a long time ago when clergy were in fact the only people who could read. Uh, and not literally, but almost literally. If you wanna read about it, there's a book called um, how the Irish saved civilization. Okay, and it was about how quite literally literacy was saved by the Roman Catholic Church because clergy knew how to read and they were the only ones. So it evolved from there and there's also this principle in the church that I believe very strongly and called that when I'm a priest, one of my jobs is quote, governance. Okay, that's one of the things they, they tell you when you're a seminarian, that as a priest, one of your jobs is to govern your church, which I try to do. Um, but I try to do it with an acceptance of my limitations. So, uh, for example, we were just joking about this today, that this is a true story. I think I've told you before, we were at a finance council meeting and I actually said these words. Are you guys ready? I have witnesses. Quote, when we had a we had an amount of money given to us, Father, use this at your discretion. So I'm at a finance council. And would you like to hear my suggestion, everyone? This was my literal word for word suggestion. Kevin Nugent is a witness. I don't know if he's watching today. Well, guys, I think we should take 40% and put it in this, 40% and put it in that, and then the last 30% we can put in that. I said that. <laughs> I'm not good at budgets. And there's a lot of priests that aren't good at it. But they, I mean, I've seen the effects. Uh, I've seen priests build huge parish centers while their church is physically falling apart. I, I, and, and I believe they're trying to do what's right. But we have to be humble and say there's things I'm not good at. I'm not good at personnel. I'm not good at money. What I'm good at, I think, is teaching. I love to teach. And I'm good at like today. I sat down at one point with Chuck and Carrie and, and Father Lay and my leadership team, right, of about six people. And I said, here's some things I'm thinking we should do. Okay, and then we talked about it. 
and we hammered out what we're going to do. Is what I said practical possible? Okay. So governing, I try to think of more like a conductor in an orchestra. It's my, not my job to play every instrument. It's my job to point to the, to the drummers when I need the drums. It's my job to tell the French horns when we need, right? Uh, I'm supposed to point and get out of the way and, and support. I think when governance comes across like a benevolent uh, monarchy, we have trouble. Okay. Does that help? Is having power a sin? No, but it's a huge occasion for sin, right? Um, and that's what I try to be super conscious of. I have too much power, okay? Um, and so what we do with that power is really important. So there was a person who came in to see me earlier this year and frankly gave me a check for our church that was one of the biggest I've ever seen. Um, and when I said to him, um, you know, I got emotional. I'm like, this is a huge help to our budget. And I, I, I just wanted to cry. And he said to me, well, f I said, just, I, I, I went on and on about the amount. I couldn't help it. And he said, oh, Father, there's plenty of people who give less but are giving more. Wasn't that something? Did I tell you about that? That blew me away. Like a guy who makes 38000 a year giving 200 bucks is a lot bigger than a millionaire giving ten grand, right? Um, and what, why am I saying that? Because think of power like money. We can get a false sense of our generosity. Uh, you know, uh, am, I, am I making sense? We can get a false sense of our generosity. Uh, because we can say, well, that's a huge amount. Yeah, but it's a small percentage. <laughs> And the same with our power. Um, does that make sense? I just see one sentence here that doesn't oh, make uh, yeah, Is that okay? Right. Oh, okay. Uh, how are we doing? Are people following? Okay. Uh, people rolling right along? Yeah. Um, uh, so what uh, I'll keep going on is uh, with the uh, ecclesia. Huh? Huh? I received... Civilization. Civilization. Okay. And I can't remember the author. It'll come to me. Yep. Uh, I think it's the same guy who wrote Why Catholics Can't Sing, but I'm not sure. Okay. I'll look okay. Um, let's see. So the, we went through the, the person, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. Yeah? Thomas Cahill. Huh? Thomas Cahill. Yes, that's who wrote How the Irish Saved Civilization, but that's not who wrote Why Catholics Don't Sing. I think that was a guy named O'Day or something. God, don't read that. That's an angry book. Um, okay, so the church sees herself, so now we see who she is, okay, hopefully. And now I want us to look at how the church, where the church sees herself existing, okay? She sees herself existing in three places, okay? <clears throat> and these are Latin terms, not English. So I want to make sure we understand them properly. We say the church militant, the church penitent, and the church triumphant. Okay, The church exists in three places. What is the church militant? That's the Catholics, the believers, who are alive on earth right now. Okay. And a lot of people love that title because then it means they get to be obnoxious and say it's Christian, or they need, get to be aggressive and say it's Christian. And they'll tell you about Jesus flipping over tables in the temple, and they don't bring up the feet washing very much, okay? And they never talk about the crucifixion. Um, militant is a recognition that we are at war and that we are living in enemy territory. Okay. That's very important. You and I understand that while we're on earth, we are on enemy territory. I think it was Chesterton, but it might have been someone else who said the best way to think of it is this. We're in a vast country ruled by an evil overlord, and we are the resistance. And we know, by the way, that the true king, the benevolent king, has already landed and the army's on the shore and he's on his way. 
we are liberated. We're just waiting for the liberator to get here. And in the meantime, we're bro blowing up rail lines. We're sabotaging communications. And how are we doing that? By prayer and good works, by selflessness. Our most powerful weapon as church militant is the power to sacrifice because evil has no power over sacrifice. You want to get aggressive and get into a fight? That's the devil's territory, and you might win sometimes. But I have watched people go into that ministry and become bent, okay? I've never seen anyone become bent from defining their ministry through sacrifice. Never. Turns out what Jesus did works. Saint, uh, Saint <laughs> Dr. Peter Kraft says, always remember, the cross is the rule not the exception, okay? Our job is to die. Our job is to give till there's nothing left. That's the church militant. We are subversive agents in the enemy camp. Battle's won. We're just sabotaging until the king gets here, okay? Then there is the church penitent, okay? What is the church penitent? Only the penitent shall pass. Uh, did you get that? Yes. Okay. Uh, the church penitent is the people in purgatory, okay? Those who have died and are in the process of heaven, okay? What does that mean? Um, what was it? Easter vigil. I chuckled at this. Uh, if you watched our Easter vigil service, this worked better if you were at the Easter vigil service. But the whole first hour of it is in darkness. We don't turn on any lights except to read, right? So well, you're all sitting in darkness for an hour, and then for the first time in 40 days, we play the Gloria. And when we pray the Gloria, we turn on all the lights. And what did everyone do? Literally, right? And it's not even that the lights were that bright, but your pupils were 17 feet wide at that point, and so the tiniest bit of light was overwhelming. That's purgatory, right? Think of purgatory that way. It's you adjusting to heaven, and there's a lot of purifying to do. You're coming in battle-scarred. You've got wounds to be cauterized, and it, you know, uh, that's important to remember. So what, do the, what does the church penitent do? Prays for us and we pray for them. There's this golden thread between them and us, and it's filled by prayers and love. And again, you'll get the people who are like, well, we, are, why, we don't pray for the dead. Okay, but we do, right? And it says in Revelations that the people in heaven are praying for us and seeking our prayer, so that seems fairly to partly cloudy important, okay? So that's the church penitent. What is our job? We pray for the dead and we trust and we ask the dead to pray for us. Okay. Um, and then finally, oh, and this is by the way, why we're big on the dead. And this is why there's a ton of rules about the dead. This is why like dad and I went to the cemetery to see mom. And on Monday, we'll uh, go see all my uncles who served uh, over in New Lothrop. We go to that graveyard there. Uh, why? Uh, because we pray for the dead. We are cognizant of the dead and we recognize that's our destiny. We are all going to die. Yeah. And then finally, oh dear, it's after one, I'm so sorry, is the church triumphant. That's the people in heaven. And I guess the best way to say it, they're happy. Yeah, it rocks. Okay. Um, so I've got more, but I think we'll just forego it. And then tomorrow you'll get to meet my dearest friend in the world. And I, I don't, I'm biased, but this is a beautiful holy priest. And I'm so excited for you to meet him. His joy, he is incredibly wise. You take, like we compliment each other. The things I'm good at, he struggles with. The things he's good at, I struggle with. Uh, and I, I just, I could go on and on and on. Um, so that's what we got an ecclesiology, it's called. Um, and again, that's just the study of the church. How does the church understand herself? And where is the church? She's on earth, she's in Perg, she's in heaven, okay? Um, oh, and by the way, what is the bridge for all three worlds, right? What's the portal? Do you know this? The mass. The mass is where all three are together. Ah, oh. okay. So I think I'll wrap us up with a prayer. Tell you beautiful people, I'll see you tomorrow. And ask us all, of course, like I said earlier, keep praying for all of the victims of the violence in Texas. Uh, pray for the aftershock of it. And pray that we decide 
we are the answer, okay? Um, and that we will be people who love and respect and cherish every human life from its natural conception until its natural death, and that there are no exceptions, even if our political party tells us there is, right? Um, so with that, salad pray. In the name of the Father, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> pardon. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus, what a mess we made of things. We are killing our children. We start early, and we continue all through their lives, and we justify our violence because we like it. We are too much at peace with violence beginning in the womb and carrying it all through life. We are too comfortable with how we think. And we have listened to voices. Oh, we've listened to everyone but yours. We've listened to teachers and leaders who lie to us and who are trying to convince us of ideologies. We listen to our political parties. And most of all, we listen to that little thing in our heart that just says, I am on this side no matter what. And it is such a tragedy because we're dying. We're killing. Oh, Lord. Remind us of how wonderful it is to belong to you so that we'll quit trying so hard to belong to stupid things. Remind us of what it means that we are yours, that we are your body, we are your bride. And for all the ways, Lord, that we inflict on other people unnecessary guilt or a distorted sense of, the, of who they are, we are so sorry. Heal the wounds we made. We are men. We are women created in your image and likeness. And we have a dignity, whether the world thinks we do or not. Oh, Lord, heal us. And help us to be instruments of that healing. Not more people shouting into the void. All the cute little slogans for this particular tragedy. Real answers based in love and truth. Answers that hurt us and compel us to sacrifice. Not tell everybody else they have to sacrifice. And help us to disabuse, disabuse us, Lord, of the, the idea that this isn't our sin. Oh, Lord, get those little ones home to you and heal all that is broken in us. We are so sorry for the mess we've made of things come to our rescue. You know all the people we love so very much and worry about. You know all the circumstances in our lives that cause us to fret. We give all of it to you, and we love you so much, and we trust you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The dog hates it when I pray. Take care, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Peace. Is it over? No, it's never over.